delighted to be able to follow Dale. She's got all these great ideas of what to do. And what I say is Dale and the folks at the Alzheimer's Association and the caregivers are the cake and the doctor. And what I'm going to be talking about, I'm the frosting. Because the basis of good dementia care is always interaction and engagement and relieving pain and suffering and boredom before you even think about any medications. So I, I definitely second all of that. And I'm delighted to talk to you about agitation. Um, just a quick side uh, note, I come to this because my mom had dementia as well. She had early onset and my mom's behavior was so bad that um, she developed painful paralysis except for one hand um, from an infection she got and her behavior was so bad that she would be waving around this one hand and they called the police because of her behavior. So I know what you're going through. Um, and it's helped me think about what are the important steps that we ought to be thinking about when we're addressing our loved ones with dementia and with agitation. So you can see the learning objectives. We're going to talk about you know, what is agitation, what are the most common manifestations, and most importantly, what does it mean and what can we do? Uh, let me get my students here. Um, this is where I wanted to start. So it's mainly irritability of mood, increased motor activity, increased conflict with those close to the person. And it can be, when you, here agitation, you have to hear exactly what are they doing, because what one person says is agitation, which I, I have very patient nurses where I work at Silverado. Um, I remember Emily called me, that Mrs. Smith, she, she called me and said, can we have help with Mrs. Smith? She won't let go of my hair. So this woman was just pulling her hair nonstop. So that's one uh, manifestation. And another manifestation would be just asking repetitive questions like, can I go home? Can I go home? Is it dinner time? Can I go home? And so you treat them very differently. Um, let me get up here. Uh, so you want to work to define the particular symptoms. You always work on the behavior modification. Um, if you're going to use medications, start low and go slow. And I will let you know I don't use Ativan. Lorazepam, I don't use Xanax, I don't use Alprazolam, I don't use Clonopin, I don't use Clonazepam. So, it's going to be kind of a different talk today. Um, what you do want to do is make sure that you look for all the causes first, because that is most important. Um, most often I find that it's related to the medications. And the reason I say I don't use any of the medications in that we call them benzodiazepines, but I'll just call it the Valium family, because everyone knows what Valium is, um, is because they work at first. And I was, I was getting a talk like this ready, and I was talking to my neighbor. I was, I was practicing in front of him, and I was saying, um, you know, you shouldn't use Xanax. He goes, oh, Xanax, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the problem with Xanax, is that, you know, I've, I've seen patients, and they look relaxed. They're not yelling. They're not moving. And they're fine for about a week or two, and then their behaviors get worse even through it. And then you need more medication, and then the behaviors are worse. And I will tell you that at least half of what I do is get people down off of those medications. So um, medications are a big issue, and we'll talk about some of the other ones that are problematic. Uh, illness or pain. I think if you take away nothing else from this talk today, um, my, my go-to medications for agitation are Tylenol and chocolate ice cream. <laughs> because most of the time, you know, if you get someone engaged and you give them chocolate ice cream and you're not battling about, you know, you got to take a shower, you need to go over here, you need to take this pill, and you treat their pain. I often see, and, and when I talk about treating pain, I think we doctors don't do it right. You know, two Tylenol every four hours is needed. How do you know if it's needed? If they're hitting you over the head, is that needed? It could be. It could be pain. Or if they're yelling out, or, you know, I... I I uh, saw a gentleman yesterday where they said, you know, he's just very verbally aggressive all the time. That's because he has horrible back pain, and I know that he's had several surgeries on his spine, but the caregivers may, might not know that. So I have a very low threshold to give at least 500 milligrams of Tylenol three times a day. We can talk more about that later. 
hearing or vision issues. That's huge. If someone can't see things, if they can't hear things, even if they don't have dementia, they can have hallucinations. So it, not being able to hear what's said can make you more worried and paranoid, and, and not being able to see what's going on makes you misperceive things. Uh, the progression of dementia can affect agitation, and then particularly care issues. You know, if you have a, it's amazing how you can have one caregiver. Isn't it true that there's always the one caregiver that can get someone to have a shower and no one else can? Yeah. You know, that's, that's, those are the people that should be talk, teaching all the rest of us. And you can't say, okay, come on, get your shirt and pants on, we have to go down and we have to get in the car. You're just going to get them all flustered. You're going to say, okay, as Dale was saying, you know, would you like the red pants or the blue pants? And take time, let them process. And, and I've got to say, as I've learned to be a little bit more patient, I can sit back and watch how long it takes them to process. And then I can say, oh, okay, this is going to take us, you know, like 10 minutes to put the pants on, but I'm not going to just plan to do anything any faster because it's not going to happen. Um, the goals of care are huge. Whenever I'm working with a new family, the first thing I want to know is, for this person, what makes life worth living? What's important to them? I've also had um, <laughs> one of the most colorful people I took care of is this um, Canadian diplomat. Oops. Oh, good. I'm not connected. Um, who spoke five languages and had been all over the world, but he was demented to the point where he couldn't really finish sentences. But he had a um, suitcase of, of cash, like a half a million dollars. <laughs> and his bathrooms were awful, his kitchen was awful, but he could go down to the kitchen, uh, excuse me, he could go down to the restaurant and he was eating and he was living okay like that. He wouldn't let us bring anything in the house. We had to, so with him, I never had him go do all his cancer screening and go to the doctor and get all the blood tests. In fact, he wouldn't let me use a stethoscope he, he wasn't safe at home. He did end up in a facility, but when I went to talk to him, I would just talk to him. I didn't do a lot of medical interventions. I mean, he didn't like a blood pressure, so I didn't do it. That's extreme. You know, we, we doctors kind of get nervous if we can't do our vital signs, at least to start with. Um, but it was what he wanted, so we worked with him. Um, so, the first thing you need to know is that if someone is agitated and they have dementia, they have a much lower threshold for becoming delirious. So, like, you all might have to have, like, a life-threatening meningococcal uh, meningitis or be hit by a bus before you're delirious. If someone has dementia and their brain is not working as well, it could be a bladder infection that makes them delirious. It can be a, it can be constipation. It can be pain. It can be pneumonia and they're not coughing. Huh. Yeah. So you have to be very careful. That said, if you take them to the uh, doctor or the hospital and they check a urine um, and there's only like five white blood cells and the fever's 102, it's not a bladder infection. So that you got to work with your doctors and nurses. Um, I'm not going to give you your medical certificate today, but just give you some ideas of how to work and, and advocate for your loved one. Um, in fact, I am trying to develop online communities at my website, elderconsult.com, um, and I'm hoping to have a place where people can bring their questions and talk about these things. The Alzheimer's Association has a fabulous website with a lot of information, and this is more for kind of more interactive, um, you know, um, care problems. Um, Okay, so the delirium. The delirium is something where it's an acute onset. Um, it is uh, mainly inattention. And it, people with dementia can be really angry, they can be yelling a lot, but what makes delirium is it's an acute onset, it's a quick change, their behavior is different, they are less attentive to what's going on around them, um, and either they have disorganized thinking where they're just not really making sense or, or they think they're in school or they think their mother's coming to get them and they're 80 years old um, or they're either really sleepy or they're really hyper alert and they haven't slept in three days. 
So that would be a, a signal that something different is going on, and delirium can be life-threatening, so they need a medical evaluation first. Um, it has a mortality of 30 to 70 percent, depending on what's going on. Uh, so you want to look for. I'm used to looking down here, so I, I, it's, it's hard for me to, to change my habits. I think I'll look back here. Yeah. Um, so the delirium can be either the, de uh, the dementia on t with also infections, most often a bladder infection, but it can be other infections. It can be new medications. It can be any severe illness. It can be an injury. Now, the thing that makes that so challenging is folks with dementia often don't have safety awareness. They're more likely to fall. And if they do fall, they're less likely to catch themselves and they may hit their head. They may fall and hit their head and not remember they did it. So you might not know that it happened. So thinking about a head injury is something that you do want to think about if you see a change of status and there hasn't been someone with them 24 hours a day. Um, also, pain can cause delirium, and so I will advocate that we treat pain more aggressively. Changes in environment, you know, either going from home to a facility or a facility to the hospital can lead to delirium. And then um, sensory deficits. Folks who have trouble with their vision or their hearing are more likely to be delirious, or if their diabetes is way off, particularly if the blood sugar is too low. Um, or if their salts are off, those are the things that can cause delirium. So you always want to look for the underlying causes. You need a medical evaluation, but then you've got to look at the medications. And I would also uh, make sure that I emphasize, if your loved one's been in a hospital and they have dementia and they have some behavioral issues, it's very likely that they got Ativan, Lorazepam. And then it's very likely that it was stopped when they went home. And what you need to do is make sure that you find out what dose they were on. And then if they did get that for more than a day or two, that you slowly taper it off. Because their rebound agitation, if you stop the Ativan quickly, can be what you're seeing when you get them home. Um, you do want to look for the infection. Impaction, constipation, huge, 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 huge. Um, and I don't say that just because I'm a geriatrician, but I think because I'm a geriatrician, I pay more attention to it. It's a big problem for folks with dementia because they often want to be private, particularly in the middle stages, and they may want to go to the bathroom by themselves, but they may not remember if they moved their bowels in maybe like five or six days. So that is always a challenge, and every team works, it out, um, works out a system themselves, but it's something to think about and the pain, we definitely want to address that. So what can we do if someone has delirium and we found out they had pneumonia or they found out they broke their hip? That's a very common one, they break their hip, they go into the hospital. Um, and here's a study that showed that um, the delirium post-op was decreased from 50% or a half down to a third by getting a geriatric consult. It's uh, decreased the severity of the delirium, but it didn't change how long that they had the delirium. But I think what we're seeing here is you're looking at the medication issue, that you're getting rid of the bad medications, you're making sure that you're treating pain, and someone's looking at kind of the whole uh, picture. Actually, has, any, has everyone here seen it? Who all seen a geriatrician before? See, so what we are, I, you know, and, and sometimes I, I hear, well, a geriatrician, isn't that like a dietitian? Um, a geriatrician, I went back and I got training after my internal medicine, so it's, it's the study of folks uh, over the age of 65. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of terrific doctors there, but I think one big thing that has happened is as our society has changed much quicker than medical school has, and back in the 60s when Medicare was started, what was the average length of um, lifespan? The average lifespan was 75? It was 61. So, A, that was good public policy because they weren't going to have to pay out that much. And B, I'm joking on that. Um, and B, uh, people didn't live that long, so we didn't see as much dementia. When folks uh, are in their 60s, the, the 
percentage of folks having dementia is 10%. When you get into your 80s, the percentage is like 40 to 50%. So it's, a, it's very different. And so we need to make, um, make sure that we adjust the medications for folks being older and frailer. We want to make sure that the blood sugars don't go too low because low blood sugar is as dangerous as high blood sugar. So blood sugar should be between 100 and 200. We should make sure the blood pressure doesn't go too low. And now they say we should run it more around 150 than 100 because particularly because if the blood pressure is too low, then when someone stands up, their pressure can drop, they get dizzy, they fall over, they hit their head. So um, these are the changes that we think of when we think about taking care of older folks. And I'm not terribly surprised you guys haven't seen any geriatricians because there's only 5,000 in the country. Wow. There used to be 12,000. Um, but it's, that's another talk. <laughs> um, let's see, so with agitation, if it's not delirium, then we still have someone who's agitated and they're kind of yelling and they may be hitting us and we have to do something about it. So what's really important to know is the situation of what's happening at the time that the agitation occurred. Is there too much stimulation? Are they sitting in a row of wheelchairs watching a loud TV and, and there's too many people around? Are they understimulated? Do they have trouble with their vision or their hearing and there's no engagement? I've, I've had a number of people yell out, help me, help me, help me. And then you go, Susie, how can I help you? I'm okay. And then you, you hold their hand or you're there with them. And, and then you go back to your work and you hear, help me, help me, help me. So you have to find ways to engage people. I probably want to engage them rather than medicate them to the point that they can't cry out at all. Um, it can also come from patients misunderstanding care. Bathing is huge. You know, if you can't remember, my mom, I would come to visit her, and I'd spend six hours with her that day, and then I'd be with her the next day, and she's like, why don't you ever visit me? And so the folks may not remember exactly why the caregivers are there to help them, particularly help them change their clothes, help them go to the uh, toilet and, and bathe them. And we have to try and make it as easy for them as possible. And again, the big things are pain, constipation, infections, and medications. So if you think about those four, when you're thinking about agitation, you've got a great start. There's certain things that just aren't going to respond to medication. Um, this is, you know, as Dale was saying, behavioral interventions are huge. You know, wandering, inappropriate verbalization, repetitive activity, willfulness, or poor self-care. Basically, you can't expect someone whose brain is not functioning um, the way it had in the past to kind of straighten up and fly right. You have to adjust with them and not put them, like, like with Christmas or let's say the 4th of July. Huh. You know, when you want to have the whole family together, maybe for mom, she should be in a side room. She should be there for a couple hours. She should have a couple people come in and, uh, at once and then switch out and then after an hour or two she's had enough let her go home and then you can set off the fireworks so here's an example an 83 year old man uh, with dementia so the mini mental status i have here this was originally for um, medical students and we doctors use the mini mental status exam as kind of a cheat sheet to tell how much dementia someone has it's a scale of one to thirty um, and if someone has more than 24, it used to be said they don't have dementia, and like 18 to 24 is mild, and 13 to 18 is moderate, and less than that is, is more severe. When you go to get your loved one diagnosed, the mini mental status exam does not diagnose whether they have dementia or not. It's a screen. So someone can have a, a mini mental status exam of 30 and still have dementia and still need care, or they could have a mini mental status 13 or 16 and still be able to make a number of choices themselves. This is just shorthand. I realize that um, it's a little confusing if I don't explain it more. So he's got moderate dementia. He developed more agitation over the weekend. He was yelling for the nurses to leave him alone. He'd been cooperative in the past and um, his brief exam is normal. So you're his family member coming to see him. What are some of the things that you would want to look at? Why don't you be brave and yell out? Pain. Good. Medications. Medications. Great. 
UTI, constipation. You guys, you guys don't need, need me anymore. You, you got it. Okay, right. So you look for the infection, the impaction, um, pressure ulcers, particularly for your loved ones who can't walk around anymore. You know, and this can happen in several ways. It can be. It's not uncommon that as dementia progresses, they lose their ability to walk. That you lose that before you lose the ability to feed yourself. But often what happens is we doctors can give medications that make them too sedated, that make them just sit. And if you let them just sit, you know, day in and day out, in some places they let them sit in the wheelchair all day. At first, you know, their, their tendons get shortened, their legs get weaker. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Hey. Um, and it's really hard to walk like this, so then they don't walk anymore, and they get left in the chair. Someone it should change position every two hours, or if they're in the bed, they need to be repositioned every two hours. And if that's not happening, they might have pressure ulcers, and you don't know. You come in to see them, mom's in the bed, she's got the you know, clean sheets over her, she looks okay. It could be pressure ulcers. You always want to look in the backside. You always want to keep your loved one moving. Um, pain and any new medications, those are the things that you have to look out for. Uh, the other issue that's really important is knowing what your goals of care are. When I was training in New York at Mount Sinai, um, I walked past this room and there was an elderly woman with a face mask on and she was tied down in her bed. It's like, well, and she was struggling and she was yelling. And I was like, so I, I looked it up and it turned out that this lady had end-stage emphysema and they had tied her down to keep the oxygen on to keep her numbers looking good. So when all else fails, look at the patient. Um, and she's thrashing and confused. So, oops, lost my slide. Um, so what needs to happen there is, you know, you want to think about, before you do any interventions or any tests, you want to think about what's my goal. If you're not going to send someone to surgery for a carotid endarterectomy, you don't have to keep doing the ultrasounds for it. You don't have to keep doing mammograms. You don't have to do prostate blood tests. You don't have to do prostate biopsies. And those sorts of things, if someone has a prognosis of less than 10 years, and most people who have dementia have a prognosis of less than 10 years. That, that is um, something that Louise Walters from UCSF had been a pioneer in showing. Not related just to dementia, but for anyone. You have to have a prognosis of 10 years before cancer screening is useful. So in this case, she's being tied down and she's miserable to keep her oxygen on. Um, what we talked to the attending about was, well, why don't we get hospice? Why don't we untie her? We can get her a fan, you know, she may tolerate oxygen in a different way. If she doesn't, we can give her morphine, we can get, you know, hospice involved. So I, I find that as people progress in dementia and their body is wearing out, I find hospice really helpful because they, it's huge. You want your, your loved one, and my mom went through this, to be in a place where they're familiar and the people caring for them are familiar with them, and you want them to be comfortable and not scared. And if someone doesn't understand the hospital, they're scared of the hospital, you gotta think several times before you send them to the hospital. You know? There's a lot of medical care that can be taken care of at home. The one time that I would really say I don't agree with that at all is if someone falls and breaks something. It is painful. And there's studies out there that says, well, you don't really have to fix the hip if they've got advanced dementia. I would like to have those doctors left without their hip fixed. You know, <laughs> hip stabilized and give medication. So that is the one time where I think you definitely have to go to the hospital. But if someone has got end-stage disease and they are not understanding the care, I would not tie them down to, to give them medical interventions. So again, the behavioral interventions are most important. Avoid the overstimulation. There was a study where they um, kept nighttime interruptions to a minimum, gave people more personal space, um, and they uh, made sure that the only interventions that were done were the ones that they were going to act on for their comfort and uh, patients did much better. Uh, again, if someone is understimulated, then they can be yelling out. Um, and then there's some behaviors that you don't want to reinforce 
if they're being quiet, you want to come up and say, hey, Susie, how are you doing? And, and, and engage them. And I think that's where getting folks engaged in the activities that they enjoy is the most important thing. Music can be helpful, tactile objects, um, really desperate white noise sometimes works. But I, I would say the um, intervention I saw that was the coolest was this man, he was down in the Bay Area. Um, his site is called Samba Samba. And he's just this guy with these bongos, and he plays the drums, and he sings. And he was at Silverado, and, and I saw people who just were stony-faced all the time really get into it and dance around. And that is fabulous. That's, that's the kind of treatment you want. Um, so here was a uh, study looking at caregivers making appropriate eye contact, announcing one activity so people can process better, delaying the assistance to give folks a chance to make the move, say, okay, sit here, and then give them the time to come over and sit down. If someone is in a bad mood, stop what you're doing. You might even have to change caregivers, or, or if you're the only caregiver, um, my friend Stephanie says, you know, change your face. You know, you, got, you put on a hat, you put on glasses, and you come back as a new person. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could do that with my teenage boys. Um, oh, and not arguing with the elder. I mean, they're not doing it on purpose. I promise you, I promise you, that there's, there's a number of patients, excuse me, elders, who have been really manipulative or controlling or nasty in their life. But then when they have dementia, they're not doing it on purpose. And this one gentleman said to me, it was great when mom forgot who we were because she was always nicer to company than she was to us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the nursing assistant group that was given the training and the motivation I had a decreased use of ineffective approaches and a decreased patient agitation in six months. So another randomized controlled trial, I like this one, this is pretty simple. They put a little monitor, you know, the, the precursor to the Fitbit, on and they show that if you keep people active during the day and don't let them sleep during the day, they'll sleep at night. <laughs> um, and so this is this is kind of a higher level issue. 74 year old uh, paraplegic man who's in a wheelchair. He's got moderate dementia, diabetes, vascular disease. He's in his wheelchair holding the staff at bay with a cane, and there's an elevator behind him. And part of you wants to let him just go away in the elevator. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> You're going to wrestle the cane away from it? So basically what can happen is if someone is becoming a behavior problem, you can get several people in there. You know, I hear, it took three of us to hold them down. I was like, oh, God. Yeah. Um, what I did was I just said, Mr. Smith, looks like you're having a bad day. And actually that just shows the benefits of a wheelchair because I just took him away. <laughs> Definitely want to get help 
with someone who uh, has more experience doing this, whether sometimes it's a neurologist, sometimes it's a psychiatrist, or if you're lucky enough to have um, a geriatrics clinic. And actually, UC Davis has one up in Davis, and then I think they also have one in North Bay? I'm not sure. Um, but look for UC Davis as well. Uh, so the different kinds, of, when we talk about medications, we're talking about different categories of behaviors. The first category is like schizophrenia, but not schizophrenia. It's delusions, psychosis, and paranoia. The second one is the easy, excuse me, the mood liability. Someone has quick anger. Um, they can have quick, uh, easy tearfulness and hitting out without warning. Um, depression is often described as irritability and withdrawn. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So this gentleman um, is a 77 year old man who's got pretty progressed dementia. He was doing well until he got more confused each night and he thought he saw his brothers who'd been long dead. And during the day, he wouldn't go to lunch because he was waiting for his mother. His, his mom had died 20 years ago. So um, this is a gentleman, would you think about, we've gotten rid of all the bad medications, we've taken care of his pain, he doesn't have an infection. Is this someone you might think about using medications? Maybe that. <laughs> So this is a gentleman who is interfering with his hair. So we did use medications. And if someone is paranoid and delusional, um, if their behavior is bad enough, then we think about using the antipsychotics. I actually don't use them as much first. Um, occasionally you can use antidepressants and that can make things uh, a little better, but if someone is quite delusional and paranoid, I find that often we have to go to the neuroethics. And the issue here is they're not FDA approved. There's a 2% increased stroke risk, a 1% increased sudden death risk, and they will make people decline faster. So if we're going to be using these medications, we're de facto palliative. And you have to think about the trade-off between quality of life for the elder, A, getting care and being safe, um, I would also say that the quality of life that the elder has with their um, primary caregiver. So I've seen a lot of situations where there's one child or the spouse that has to kind of single-handedly try and care for this person who's getting really angry and paranoid, and that's the person that the um, elder with dementia is really angry with. And I've seen that if you adjust the medications, that you can re repair that relationship and I actually think that's another reason to use the medications, understanding that they are difficult to use, they will cause decline, and you want to get rid of them as soon as possible. So everyone's heard of how well, that's one of the older ones. Um, I don't ever use that. Uh, actually, on my website, um, there's a section on medications. It's elderconsult.com slash medications. And it has written in English uh, more detailed explanations of these medications, what they're used for, and what the side effects can be. Um, the Risperdal and, excuse me, the Zyprexa should not have an S there, uh, and this are, are more likely to make people stiff and should not be used in Parkinson's. The Seroquel is more likely to make people sleepy, um, but is less likely to make them stiff. So all of these can affect their walking. You want to be careful of that. Uh, and they can give them tremors. So, and the, the worst thing is, occasionally I've seen someone can start having stroke-like symptoms. If that happens, you stop the medication and get them seen right away. Or you have the goals of care that they're on hospice, and you have the hospice caregivers come take care of them. So here's a 74-year-old man with dementia and mod, uh, moderately severe. He thinks he's on a boat and sees a variety of creatures that he enjoys talking to. He's been bed bound for years. He's eating and sleeping well. What do you do? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Join him. Um, you leave him alone because he's not bothered by it and his care is not affected. And you know, frankly, um, if there are pleasant hallucinations and you're bed bound, you know, that's kind of like having your own Netflix. <laughs> um, the other issues are mood liability, and this is where it gets really kind of controversial. So the mood stabilizers, there are studies that show that they don't work, but the studies have been done while people are on Ativan, 
or Aricept. And they don't tease out who did what. Um, if someone does have quick anger, uh, Depakote can be helpful for the anger. It has its own side effects. It can cause liver abnormalities and, and decrease blood cell counts. It can affect walking. It can cause drowsiness as well. The antidepressants, they are not all made the same either. Um, the, the ones that are more commonly known, the Prozac, the Paxil, the Zoloft, Celexis, Citalopram, um, those can be helpful, but I would say do not use Paxil, do not use Prozac. They are too stimulating and the, the Paxil has anticholinergic features. And I want to take a minute to talk about, well, what's anticholinergic? Um, so as this morning they probably discussed that the, the, the nerve cell endings um, usually talk by choline, and as you develop uh, dementia, the amount of choline decreases. And so that's why we want to use Aricep, Nemenda, or Exelon, because 10 to 30% of the folks get better behavior, and it increases the choline. But what we want to really avoid is anything that's anticholinergic. So if someone's having trouble sleeping, Tylenol PM is not a good idea. Not that Tylenol is not bad, that along with ice cream is my favorite medications, but that uh, the Benadryl can make them more confused. And even though it's sold over the counter, it's probably the worst thing your loved one with dementia can have. So the Paxil also is anticholinergic. It can make them more agitated. The Prozac doesn't have that, but it's very stimulating. So you don't want to give someone whose brain is not functioning terrifically a lot of stimulation because often they'll just get more agitated and it can make them not sleep. So I've often seen people who are on Prozac for their behavior and then they're on Ambien because they're not sleeping. Well, Ambien works pretty much like Ativan and Xanax does, even though they said it's not addictive, and it's going to cause more problems. They also can cause nausea, vomiting, weight loss because you lose your appetite and sometimes low salts. Um, Effexor is in another category with Simbalta, which is also popular. I don't have much time, so I'm not going to go through all these, but they're on the medication section of my website, elderconsult.com. Um, so you don't want to use those in people who are having trouble sleeping. So, back to my, my uh, favorite targets of, of scorn. Um, Ativan is something that you can use for a day or two. If you've got to move someone, if they're uh, having uh, a hip fracture and have to, procedure, have to have a procedure, or if they are going to have their teeth cleaned, you can use Ativan once or so, but then you've got to watch them until the Ativan wears off. Um, Halcyon is a sleeping pill. That's not good. Uh, and all of these can lead to falls, and they really make them more confused, and they look worse after the medications have been stopped, so they always have to be taken. So then you really want to make sure you're reassessing. Um, this is a 72-year-old woman who had uh, schizoaffective disorder and also recurrent pneumonias. She was on a strong antibiotic for recent pneumonia. She's lethargic and needed oxygen um, because her oxygen was decreasing. She was on a large dose of olanzapine, which is Zyprexa, and it was, she was over sedated. So if your loved one is over sedated and they're on one of these medications, then you've got to think about um, stopping it or decreasing it. So I've seen a number of times where they're looking lethargic and, and the medications that cause sedation are overlooked. Make sure you take those off. It can also make you quite stiff. I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go through this one. So you always want to work to define the particular symptoms. You always want to work on the behavior modification. If you are going to use medications, start at a low dose and go slow. And team assessment is crucial. I ask my caregivers, I ask my therapists, you know, what are you seeing? You know, what's going on? You really want to pin it down and be specific. So I think I have time for a few questions. Uh, one or two, yeah. One or two. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, that's okay. Um, any questions? And I'll be here you know, after. Yeah, afterwards. we have a 15 minute break right after, and Dr. Lancer is going to be around. Okay. Uh, this is where I get my exercise. I love this part of the program. Uh, I just, I'm an activity assistant at a skilled nursing facility. Um, I deal with, I now have out of 50 patients, I have 
four that are severe in, in bed in the last stages of Alzheimer's. One in particular does not do well in a group at all, but she's of course the biggest wanderer there is. So what would you suggest? She, I, she probably needs a one-on-one -on -one, uh, assistant, I think. Right, so this is a big question. I'm a medical director for a 110-bed dementia facility. And if you have someone who is really unsafe, they've really got behavior problems, and you know there's a lot of great assisted living dementia care residences, but most of them are not set up to provide one-on-one -on -one care. And so you either have to, like at Silverado, it's nice because there's someone at the front gate, and so they can't get out. Cool. That takes care of a lot of problems. If you're in a facility that does not have that sort of security, then you have to think about getting them to somewhere that's more secure, um, or have a one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, that's... Yeah, she's in a secure place. Okay. Okay. And, and then if they don't do well with other folks, but they do better by themselves, I have had folks where... You know, if you can keep them, so particularly, so you know, they will sleep at night, you know, asking the families if they can have someone to engage them for a couple hours in the afternoon so they don't sleep then. And that can help somewhat. Um, I have had folks who are fall risks. Huh. That's, you know, kind of one of the scary things in a big uh, facility. And those people sometimes I've asked that they have either a one-on-one -on -one or they go to a smaller place where they can be watched more closely. If you're in your skill, you know, that's, that's more limited. I mean, I think you're on top of everything. Uh, you're not supposed to restrain folks, but I've also had folks who are really impulsive. And you, you bring them to an activity, you sit them in their wheelchair, and then you just push the chair under the table. And I know that there's some advocates who get upset with me, but it's like, you know, if you can't, if there's not the possibility of having one-on-one, -on -one, that is the next best thing. And I remember years ago, I saw people in beanbag chairs, where they can be with you, you know, um, and you have to worry about them. Seriously, you know, they're not going to get hurt. Um, they can roll around, but they're not going to leave. <laughs> now, so, so the other thing is, you know, falls at night. I'm a huge fan of a low bed and a mat and an alarm because you don't really care if they get out of bed. You care if they get hurt. So if they go down four inches, they're not likely to get hurt. And the other benefit is most people can't get up from um, four inches. You know? So you have to kind of be creative. We are very creative. Yes. Uh, one more question. Who has a hand up? Oh, I can go. All right, Sheila. You can yell loud enough before. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was very refreshing to hear that you don't use a lot of medication, and I'm wondering how you feel about marijuana. <laughs> so I actually have had one family that used marijuana, um, and their loved one just had no appetite, and they gave her little pinches of chocolate. You know, frankly, um, I yeah. So with, with folks with dementia. Um, I don't advocate the alcohol because it's more disinhibiting. Most of my folks are too disinhibited, and I want to keep them together. And I, I'm not going to make them give up their, you know, cocktail rituals if, you know, there's non-alcoholic wine, uh, beer, and then if they really like bourbon, we'll, we'll cut it, you know, one to six or something like that so they can have it. But I think it's kind of anything that is just really disinhibiting because they can also fall over. I found that if I treat the pain, and I, I'm sorry, I'll make sure I, I address this more, but when I talk about treating pain, I don't mean just Tylenol and Tramadol. I'm talking narcotics if you need narcotics. I'm talking about using gabapentin, and I'm finding that Lyrica is really helpful for nerve kinds of pain. So I will not, I, I just haven't found a need for it. I've worked with like 3,000 families, and anything, you know, there's a lot of folks who want to use nutraceuticals, and I don't have the studies. I don't quite know what in there. There might be ephedrine in there, and it, things can go shooting off one way or another. I don't quite know how to work with that. Um, but I find if I treat the pain, I get them engaged. You know, if you eat enough chocolate, you get THC. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wouldn't do it. Maybe there's going to be some studies that show that it's helpful. It's probably more helpful for the caregivers. 
Um, but um, I, I just would prefer to, to engage them and give them things that I know what's going to cause a response. Okay. Uh, well, I'll be here. Yep, she'll be right in the front table here. Thank you, Dr. Landsberg.